Well, we're in our new series called The Church Awake, and uh, I know a lot of you were out last week. It was Labor Day weekend. We had a lot of people traveling, a lot of people out. Uh, So I want to catch a little bit up to speed uh, of what we talked about last week as we kind of kicked this uh, this off, and that is that we talked about a biblical worldview, what it means to have a biblical worldview. Every single person in this room has a worldview of some kind, and that worldview is kind of the filter of everything that happens in your life, all your experiences, all your thoughts, everything you see, we have a worldview that we filter that through. And we understood last week that the world has a worldview. There's a secular ideological worldview revolution that's going on that the world has that takes God out of the picture. And it's this philosophical movement, this philosophical, philosophical lifestyle that moves forward with that understanding even if it's not true. And so if you have a biblical worldview, you approach things differently. And we talked about it being a filter. Well, today I want, to, want you to think about it this way. If you've ever been to a 3D movie, by the way, I hate 3D movies. I don't like them. I don't know why. I just don't. But one of the cool things that I do appreciate is that I, I don't like when I look at the image and I can't see it and it's distorted. We have an image that's kind of like this, right? That you walk in and you see something and you're like, okay, I kind of know what it is, but it just doesn't look clear. And then what do you do? You put on your 3D glasses, right? Now you're super cool. 3D glasses, right? And this is fun getting to watch all of you do this, but you put on your glasses and now all of a sudden you can see it a little better. Now in this room, the screens are not that big from where a lot of you are seated. So it might not be as clear as it could be if you're a little bit closer. Like for me, I could see it pretty clearly when I put them on. Now I do have to ask, you got to take them off because I can't, I can't keep going uh, like this, especially you junior hires. I know you're going to try to sit there the whole time. Go ahead and take them off for me because um, I want to be able to talk to you. But, but here's the picture that you can see a different depth when you put these on. When you look at it without these glasses, without these lenses, it's distorted. And there's a lack of understanding, a lack of clarity. And a lot of people in our world today are walking around having a distorted view of reality. And if you have a biblical worldview, it's like putting those lenses on and you can see the truth. You can see an added depth and dimension that other people can't see. This is a critical understanding. So actually, I'm going to ask you, take these home and put them somewhere that will be a good reminder for you to every single day to put on your biblical lenses, your biblical worldview, be a good reminder for all of us. But I talked about in this series, we're going to look with a biblical worldview. Everything we do is going to be based on what God's word says. In our first service, we had our first graders and we presented them with the Bible. They stood all right here, all the way across. We had a bunch of them and I told them to hold up their Bible and, and so, that the, so that the people in the room could see. And a lot of them did this. They raised it up above their head. And I thought, you know what? That's exactly what we're talking about. That we would lift up God's word above our opinions, above our experiences, above everything else. And that would be the lens through which we view everything, the filter that we use in everything we do, that God's word would be above our opinions, above our experiences, and the filter and the lenses we use for everything we do. And in this series, we're talking about the church awake. We're talking about the things in our world that the church can be asleep that the people of God, the Christian people can be asleep. And I said, we're going to be tackling a bunch of different issues, a bunch of different uh, scenarios, a bunch of different things in our world right now that a lot of people aren't willing to talk about, especially in the church. We're going to tackle those things. And a lot of people would say, well, these are political matters. I want you to know that they're not just, we talked about this last week. They're not just political matters. They're personal matters. Because there's a lot of people in this room that are dealing directly with these things. It's not just politics like something that's happening in Washington or in the state capitol or something like that. This is stuff that you and I are dealing with day in and day out. I've got three kids. I'm telling you that these things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks, these issues that we're going to be looking at, these matters that we're going to be taking charge of, what we're going to be looking at, these are personal They're personal to me. They're personal to you. If you live in this country, you live in this world, they're personal, which also makes them pastoral. That means that it's important for us as as a church family to get together. For me as, as the pastor, when I've been charged to make sure that our people know and understand what God's word says. And so I take that seriously. I take that burden very heavily that that's my responsibility. And so we're gonna try to look into God's word and say, what does God's word say? Because that's what matters, what God's word says. So we're going to be looking at these issues in the coming weeks. 
We're going to look at the heart of the issues. We're going to look at the root of the issues. And I said it last week, and I'll say this again. We're going to start with love. Our picture is going to be that we're going to come from an angle of love. It's our standard is not tolerance. Our standard is not acceptance. Our stand, standard definitely is not any kind of allegiance to the world's way, to the secular ideological revolution that's going on. That's not our standard. Our standard is love. But we have to understand that love and truth go hand in hand. And so we're going to stand on truth. We will not. I said it last week and I'll say it again. We will not call anything right that God says is wrong. We're going to stand squarely and firmly on the truth of God's word. And that's why we're going to be spending a lot of time in God's word, looking at a lot of scripture, understanding very clearly what God's word says. As we are people who are defined by love, we're going to always speak the truth and we're going to do it in love. We looked at Romans chapter 12 that says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And today we're going to look back in the Old Testament. We're going to look at some people that we get to see actually live out this idea. In Daniel chapter 3, if you have your Bible, open up to Daniel chapter 3. If you've grown up in church, if you grew up as a kid in church, you probably know this story, but we're going to take a look at it and really see what God says to each of us today and maybe see something a little bit new today. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That's 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, they had all gathered, the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So here's the declaration. You either bow down or burn up. You have two choices, bow down or burn up. It says, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the instruments, all the nations and the people of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now we know that not every single person did this. And so we find out in the next verse that this, at this time, some astrologers came forward to denounce the Jews. They came to Nebuchadnezzar. They said, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the instruments must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then it says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? He says, now I'm gonna give you another chance. Now, when you hear the sound of the instruments and the music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image of I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? I want you to understand that question. You're going to bow down. If you don't, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace. He says, then what God can rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. You just asked what God could save you. We know a God that could save us. We know a God that could deliver us from your hand. But here's what's so great. They say, but even if he doesn't, we know a God that can save us. But they said, but even if he doesn't save us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. We know a God that can save us, but we also know he might not. And even though we know that there's a chance he might not, he might not choose to do that. But even if that's true, we're still not going to bow down. 
It says Nebuchadnezzar was furious. It actually says he got so furious that his face was distorted. So he had the furnace heated seven times hotter. He got his strongest men to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them in. It actually says that it was so hot that the men that threw him in died. Threw those guys in, they died. That's how hot it was. And then what happens is Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and it says he stands up and he looks in. He says, how many guys did we throw in there? Because I remember three. They said, yeah, we threw in three. He said, I'm looking one, two, three, four. There are four people in that furnace right now and they're walking around. And one of them looks like the son of God. This, by the way, is the pre-incarnate Christ, not to be confused with reincarnation like we talked about last week. Pre-incarnation, the pre-incarnate Christ, a picture of Jesus walking with them. Here's what I want you to understand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through it. And you can imagine the picture of what they're having to deal with as they go through all of this, right? They say, you know what? We know a God that can save us. We know a God that can save us, but even if he doesn't, we refuse to bow. And I kind of wonder what this, what this might have looked like. From the time that they refused to bow and then their death sentence was proclaimed, what they were thinking. I wonder what it looked like for them. Because have you ever been in a situation where you're like, you know what, God, I feel like I'm walking with you. I'm walking in obedience to you, but this doesn't feel great. Like, I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit maybe terrified of what's to come. God, I trust you, but I'm headed to the furnace right now. I'm tied up, and they are walking me to the furnace to throw me in. It's such an amazing picture of what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. But then what happened, it says Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace, he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, you need to come out. But when he said that, he said this. He said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. (laughs) Remember just a minute ago, he was like, what God could save you from my hand? Now he's saying, oh, the Most High God that saved you from my hand, you guys come on out. Now he's declaring something about the most high God. And then it says, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him. They defied the king's command, were willing to give up their lives. What are you willing to give up? It says they trusted him and were willing to give up their lives. What are you willing to give up because you trust him? says they would not serve or worship any God except their own God. And then he says, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you kind of listen, you're like, man, he's saying praise be to the God. And they're going, yeah, he's starting to get it. And then he says this, whoever says anything against their God will be cut into pieces, their house be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. They're like, well, they kind of missed it there. But like, that's, that's kind of what how it goes. I mean, he's starting to go the right direction and then he totally misses it. And then it says in verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. He promoted them. So why this story? Why today? It's a story of great courage, right? And I want to remind you that it takes great courage, obviously, to be doing what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. It doesn't mean that there is no fear, We have this tendency, I don't know why, all of us have this tendency to think that courage is the absence of fear. Like I'm just pressing on, I'm not afraid of anything. That's, that is not courage at all. You know what? Like me taking a step, I wasn't afraid of that step. You might be like, that was so courageous, right? No, that's not courage. Courage is when you're afraid of something, when you're terrified of something and you move forward anyways, that's what courage is. And this is probably the way they walked in, that they're like, hey, listen, we know we might end up in that furnace, but we still need you to know that we're going to move forward with what God said. It takes great courage to do what they did. It also takes great faith to do what they did, right? They trusted in God. They believed. They said, we know a God that can save us. We have faith in a God who can save us. But on top of that, it also takes great resolve because they had to say, you know what? But even if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like if we knew that God was not going to rescue us from the furnace, guess what? We're still resolved to obey him. You might cut my head off. You might make me lose my job. You might cut me from the team. You might 
cancel me. You can do whatever you want to do, but I want you to know that all of those things can happen. It's still not going to change what I do. That's what they're saying. They're saying, you can do whatever you want to me. We know God can save us. We know God can provide. We know God can do whatever he wants to do. But even if he doesn't do it the way we'd hope he does, we're committed to him. We're resolved to be obedient to him. And then we also see that there's a great outcome. They were protected in the furnace. And then guess what? They were promoted. And how were they promoted? I want to remind you of something. They were promoted by an evil king. God used an evil king to promote them. I said it last week, and I want to tell you again, God can use anybody. God can use anybody, and he does it all the time, all throughout history. God is moving at all times. God can use anybody. He used this king. So when you think and answer a question, why do you think they didn't bow like everyone else did? Like if, you had, if you really process, why do you think it was that they didn't bow? I believe that they understood something that other people didn't. I believe that they had something that other people didn't that makes it really important. First Peter chapter 2 kind of talks about where I think this comes from. Verse 8 says, They stumble because they do not know God's, because they do not obey God's word. So they meet the fate that was planned for them. He says, But you, Peter writing, he says, But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And then he says this, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. I warn you as temporary residents, as foreigners, to stay away from these worldly desires. He says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I believe the reason that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow is because they knew they were not at home. They weren't at home. Now, I want to say that in a couple different ways. Number one is if you know anything about history and you know anything about the time, they were exiled in Babylon. What happened was the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, was basically taking over the world at that time. He had won one of the greatest battles for all of the world and basically had power, conquered all the other nations. And part of that conquering, he went through Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem. And as they conquered it, they didn't destroy Jerusalem. What they did was they kind of left it standing, but they said, you're now ours. And they took the best and the brightest out. We talked last week about how some of the worst, most evil leaders in the history of the world have said some kind of statement like, if you will give me the children, I will have them for life. So what did they do? Guess what? In 605 BC, they took the kids. They took the best and the brightest. They took the young people out. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of that. And so they took them, took them back to Babylon. Guess what? They might've taken them as captives, but when they got there, they said, we don't want them to be slaves. We want them to love this place. We want them to think that this is home. And so they fed them really well. They fed them from the king's table. They gave them great education, the greatest education you could find in the world. And they said, we're gonna make them one of us. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that wasn't their home. And by the way, I want you to understand that this isn't just talking about location on the earth, one city or another city. This, they knew that this was not their home because they knew that they were built for an eternal kingdom. And there was an eternal God and their citizenship, even though it might've been their hometown in Jerusalem, their citizenship was in heaven. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we have to understand that this is not our home. You will not find a place. You will not find a party. You will not find anywhere that is your home. If you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, this is not our home. And I think that lens in and of itself made him understand something a little bit different. And they looked at things a little bit different about that. So when Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, I'm going to build this statue. It's 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, made of gold. They can look at it and say, that little G God is not the most high God. 
And that little king, Nebuchadnezzar, is not the king of kings. And so no matter what the king says, I've got a king that is above him and I'm going to follow my king, not that king. For you, it might be a boss. You might say, well, I've got a boss, but I have the boss. And so I'm going to follow my boss, not just this boss. And so I'm going to live differently because I have a different understanding that I'm a child in the kingdom of God. I'm a kingdom citizen. And so guess what? This isn't my home. So I'm going to live different. New Testament basically says it this way, being in the world, not of the world. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer a part of the world. In other words, you used to belong to the world. He says, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world and therefore it hates you. In other words, your, your allegiance is no longer to anything the world has to offer you. This secular ideology, this worldly ideology, you don't have to have allegiance to it because guess what? You've been called out. You're a part of a new kingdom. He says, you are in the world, but you're not of the world. It says the world hates you. If you were of the world, if you were just like everybody else, guess what? The world would love you. But Jesus says, I chose you to come out, so it hates you. Then he's praying as a part of the Last Supper in John chapter 17. He's talking to God. He says, but now I am coming to you, talking to God the Father. He says, I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not ask you, he's saying, God, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. In other words, leave them here, but help them to understand that this is not their home. This is the idea that what Jesus is praying. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. And how do you sanctify them in your truth? By the understanding that your word is truth. When we understand that, it changes everything. The idea of being in the world is about location, but of the world is about direction. So my question is, all of us right now are in the world or on the world, but we're here. Our location is here. But the question is, where is your direction coming from? Where are your instructions coming from? Where is your information coming from that you use to filter everything you do in your life? All your experiences, all your direction, everything you do, all your behavior, everything you see. It's one thing to be located in the world. It's another thing to be directed by the world. We have to understand the difference. Citizens of the kingdom of God understand they are in the world, but not of the world. I want to finish with this. I want you to think about maybe something a little different. I want you to picture those three guys, right? All the instruments play. And after the instruments play, obviously in the plain of Dura at that time, it's a very flat, a 90-foot statue, 90-foot tall, 9 feet wide all the dust settles. Everybody starts moving, right? Everybody hits their face. The dust settles. When the dust settles, everybody kind of looks up. They see a 90-foot statue and they see three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we say, man, that's so much courage. And it is. I kind of wonder if they were together or by themselves. I don't know if they were like, I always kind of envisioned them standing like three side by side doing it together. But I kind of wonder if maybe they were on their own. I don't know. I don't know that it would have mattered, but I want you to think about what they were thinking. Because I imagine what probably happened, and I've never thought about this before, never seen this before, never even heard this before, but you start imagining for just a second what happens if you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The dust settles, and you're standing there looking around. I can't help but think they must, must have thought, am I crazy right now? Because there are a lot of people that came from Jerusalem, the people of God, the Israelites, the people who know God, know his plan, know his ways, know his will, and they're all here. Why am I standing here by myself? Where are all those people? Why are they on their face right now? Am I crazy? 
Here's one of the tragedies of our world right now. One of the tragedies of our nation right now. One of the tragedies of the Christian church right now is that there are a lot of people who know what God's word says. They know the truth of God's word. And guess what? When it comes to the secular ideology, they're on their face before it. That's a tragedy. An absolute tragedy. I can't help but think they were thinking, they were thinking these people know better. What are they doing? There are people who claim the name of Jesus who are sitting in this room. I'm not talking about people out there. There are people who claim the name of Jesus sitting in this room who when secular ideology comes up, they'll bow before it. By the way, we're not going to point at the people next to us because all of us do it in some form or fashion. All of us have done it. But the danger and the thing that makes me scared to death, terrified, I don't know if that's the right word, but frustrated, all the things, the thing that kills me is the people who choose to do it. It's one thing to say, God, I made a mistake, you know, and I've, I had an opportunity to say something, to step up and, and be truthful and speak your truth in love, and I just held back and I didn't do what I should have done. God, I'm so sorry. Will you help me to be bold next time? That's one thing. All of us have had a time where we could say that, right? But there are other people that say, you know what, I know what God's word says, but you know what, my opinion matters more right now. What I think matters more. What other people say matters more. What the world thinks matters more than what God thinks. And so I'm going to bow down. And that's what kills me right now. And so in these coming weeks, we're going to continue to lift up the word of God. And I wanted to make a challenge. If you claim the name of Jesus, if you say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, guess what Lord means? It means he's my master. And when I, last I checked, when he's my master, whatever he says goes. And so my answer to him is, if that's what you say, I'm going to do it. If that's what you say, you know better than I do. Guess what? You're the one that created me, and so I'm going to submit to you because there's nothing I can offer that's better than what you already know. And that's why I find out that your will is good and pleasing, and it's perfect. And everything the world offers me, everything the world offers me inside, in my flesh, and outside is of no value compared to God what you offer what you tell me to do. So when the music plays, what are you going to do? When your boss says, if you don't do this, then I can't keep you on. What are you going to do? Your principal says something, your coach says something, your friends say something, your neighbors say something. What are you going to do? Are you going to submit to them or submit to the Lord? Are you going to submit to the world or are you going to submit to God's word? I want to say this. If you're honest and you say, you know what, I've been one of those that I've been bowing to the world, even in the way I think, even the way I talk, in the way I have been believing, I've been bowing to the world. Guess what? If you've been on your face in that way, today I want you to receive grace and know that God loves you. And you can today say, God, I realize I've made that mistake and I want to turn away from making that mistake. I don't want to make that mistake anymore. And God, I'm going to put you first where you belong and I'm going to put you back in your rightful place. You can do that today. You don't have to walk out of here hopeless and defeated. You can walk out and say, God, I'm going to get it right. By your grace, by your wisdom, and by your strength, I want to get it right. So I'm going to turn away from thinking my own way and I'm going to submit to your word. I want you to know you could do that today. If you're one of those that you say, you know what, I do submit to God's word. I'm not getting my directions from the world. I'm not allowing them to set the course of my life. I'm getting my directions from God's word and say, God, help me to continue to do that. Help me to do it in truth and in grace. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for courage. It's time for faith. It's time for the people of God to say, you know what? I know a God who can provide for me. I might lose my job here, but I know a God who's going to provide for me. I realize that it could cause me to, to be put off, to be, to be canceled, could cause a lot of different things, could cause me to lose some friends, could cause me to lose a lot of things, but I'm not worried about that. What I want more than anything else is I want to obey and honor God. That's it. That's my goal. That's my desire. And so you know what? I know a God who can take care of me, who can protect me, who can even promote me, who can watch over me. But even if it doesn't happen the way I want, my number one job is obedience. Submission to the Lord and obedience to him and his word. 
The world needs Christians who will stand. Here's the truth. I don't expect people who don't know God to understand all this. I shouldn't have to. But guess what? I could still take a stand. The world needs people who will not stand against. I'm not talking about going to parades and festivals and stuff and shouting at people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about standing against people. I'm talking about standing up. The world needs the church and the body of Christ to stand up.